try to resume it in Berlin and say, you know, why don't we just partition Africa and share Africa among, Africa amongst ourselves and we call it colonies, right? So that was how colonialism started on the continent of Africa. And everybody in Europe that had a gun went to Africa in search of people and resources that they could control. So the Italians, you know, went as far as uh, Ethiopia, but they weren't so lucky. They were defeated in Ethiopia and they ran back. You know, they had the British states also in Libya. And uh, that was how Gaddafi came about. I think Gaddafi was known to have told one of the colonial masters when he was expelled from school as a rascal when he was younger, that you drove me out of class, I'll drive you out of this country. And that's what he went out to do. But they never forgave him for doing that, yes. Uh, the Brits went to Nigeria, they colonized Ghana, and a number of places, uh, you know, even Portuguese people uh, went and colonized Angola, uh, and I think Guinea-Bissau. Uh, the French went to Nice, they colonized everywhere they could find. Uh, they sent some of their worst characters to go and govern African colonies. In fact, when there was uh, a struggle to kick them out of, uh, uh, I think, Guinea, they were so upset that they removed even all the telephone poles, including cash register. Because the guy who was the colonial master there was 20 years old boy. He couldn't just understand why these Africans wanted independence. Mm -hmm. So when the independence war was won, uh, they removed everything they could. Uh, in reality today, the French government never left Africa to be by itself. They controlled the economic life of Africans that were their former colonies. They intervened wherever they wanted. Uh, so they've helped a lot of African dictators to remain in power, including you know, one of the African relics uh, known as Paul Bia in Cameroon mm -hmm. to today. Mm -hmm. So that's the history of Africa in a nutshell. So when you're hearing about Africa, you're hearing about bad governance and dictatorship, it's there's collective blame to go around, especially where people have been uh, hypocritical about good governance, they've been hypocritical about uh, what I would call democracy and human rights. It's just like you look at America today, America double speaks about democracy and human rights. When the Saudi Arabia, they are fine with you know, the Saudi Arabian uh, monarchy, and you know, up to the point that they are so good with Saudi Arabia that the Saudi Arabian leaders could go and kill a journalist. Mm -hmm. And America would say to you, hey, you know, yes, it's a bad idea to kill a journalist, but we're still going to continue to do business. Yes. You know, we just got huge orders for our weapons from Saudi Arabia, so we have to keep it while we find out who killed the journalist. By now, everybody knows who killed the journalist Khashoggi, right? Jamal Khashoggi. But America doesn't care. And I've lived in America for 19 years, I can tell you. That's America for you. So, and then you look at Nigeria, what is the primary interest of the West in Nigeria? Resources, oil. And as long as there's flow of oil out of Nigeria, they don't really care much about human rights. In fact, in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, the critical violators of human rights in, in Niger Delta region of Nigeria, you know, the oil companies, American companies and British oil companies, French oil companies, Italian oil companies, they are also the greatest promoters of corruption on the continent. There's an investigation going on in Italy over how INI, you know, ENI, uh, Egypt, uh, bribed Nigerian officials, Simeon has been involved in bribing Nigerian officials. Charlie Button in the U.S. has been involved in bribing Nigerian officials. And it will go beyond that also, where corruption is not being aided by oil companies, they have been aided by British and American, you know, European banks, you know, including Switzerland. Switzerland will tell you that they've never been engaged in war, they're a peaceful nation, but you can steal and rob your country and go and keep it in Switzerland, they're fine with it, you know. Up until recently, where they reluctantly give back some of the stolen world out of Africa. I'm just giving you this background experience uh, to let you know that when you talk about leadership in Africa, you have to understand, are Africans really, really leading themselves? Or you just have puppets on the continent of Africa, leading Africa, reporting back to 
their colonial masters or neo colonial masters. Uh, I, I don't know much about what Australia is involved and you know how much you guys are involved in Africa, so you might be blameless today until I find out about you guys. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure somewhere, <laughs> somehow, you have economic interest somewhere on the continent of Africa. It's just not obvious. And where you are not doing it, obviously, you are probably part of, you know, the big gangs out there who is like, yeah, you look the other way when they're doing bad things. And that's as bad as being complicit as well. So I'm speaking this directly to you because for Africa to find its feet in the world, Africa must be led by authentic African leaders, not puppets. Uh, it's that Africa must find its real independence. I think you guys are lucky that you used to be governed by, you know, the Brits, right? I think, yeah, colonized by the Brits. But now you have your own government, you know, and your unit of measurement is even different from theirs. You know, you don't play soccer, you decide to play rugby. We are not that lucky in Nigeria. You know, we don't have a local league. You know, everybody is supporting the UK based premiership. You know, every day it's crazy how colonialism is not only, you know, physical. Even after they've left physically, mentally, Africans are colonized. You know, it's what we call colonial mentality, sang by a fellow Nicola Kokuti that he mentioned before. Mentally, Africans in Nigeria are killing themselves, practically, I mean, you know, shooting and killing themselves over who wins and loses during the Premiership League. And they're poor, it doesn't reduce their poverty in any way, it doesn't improve their lives in any way, but if you're not a Man U fan or an Arsenal fan or, or a Chelsea fan, you're nobody in Nigeria. So that's what they call seriously colonial mentality. So, so I'm reaching you with that background so that you can understand very much what Africa is today or where Africa is today. But in some ways, there's some flicker of hope and good news and you probably have heard about Ethiopia. Uh, recently. Ethiopia used to be governed by brutal dictators, but they realized the futility of you know, uh, their own brutality. And the new leadership has emerged out of Ethiopia that is doing interesting things, including letting them go of prisoners of conscience, you know, there's less crackdown on, uh, on uh, dissent ahead. Uh, and I'm not sure if this was not misquoted anywhere. Today, I think they have for the first time a female president of, you know, because the old one there resigned, and there's a younger person who is now the premier of Ethiopia who is doing so many interesting things. So, uh, just in a nutshell, what Africa needs is a generational, you know, transfer of power. There's a huge generation of Africans out there who have gotten out seen the rest of the world, had the best exposures they need uh, to understand how the world is working out there. And they are willing to come back and take Africa to the next level. So that Africa is not seen as this place you must go and find resources, but a place where you can go and interface and interact with real people. Uh, I, when I start my classes every year in, in, in the US, I show a movie in my, to start my class. This is a movie you probably seen it before, The Girls Must Be Crazy. And I asked my students if they believe Africa is still alive. And they said, yes, I can't wait to see Africa. And their own concept of Africa. Yes. It's what is, the what is in that movie, you know, is like Africans running around without clothes on. And, you know, someone throwing a bottle of Coca-Cola down and African worshipping the bottle of Coca-Cola, you know. It's, it, does, it may not make much sense to you, but look. If you look at it, what is it that Africans are worshipping? You know, it's something that someone transferred to them to tomorrow because they abandoned everything they know or they've ever heard about. And it is what the white person brought, the white man brought to Africa that's authentic to Africa, including the sports, you know, everything that is not out of art, that's not from Africa, is what Africa sees that's authentic. But this new leadership uh, that is coming the way of Africa is going to make things different. It's going to interact with the rest of the world differently because we understand the world. We are going to try to process our own uh, goods and services without having to send cocoa, for example, to Switzerland to be processed into uh, chocolates, uh, which is always amazing to me in that you have to send cocoa 
to Switzerland that doesn't grow cocoa and it's made into chocolate. And Af most Africans who grow cocoa have never tasted chocolate before. Yeah, and if you show it to them, they're like, wow, this is interesting. So it reminds you of the Gospels, are crazy. Like, you know, somebody's throwing a wrapper of chocolate out of, his, of the car, and they're like, Africans are like holding on to it, like the wrapper, it was like, wow, we've never seen this before, and they start worshiping it. Uh, but cocoa is from, you know, Africa, Nigeria. You know, same thing with oil. Crude oil is taken out of Nigeria. Nigeria used to have refineries, but we don't have refineries anymore, we take them out. They are refined and they bring back just gasoline, petrol, or kerosene, and we queue up. In Nigeria, the people still queue up to buy kerosene, and crude is taken out of Nigeria. Over, we've made over $600 billion from selling crude to the rest of the world in the last maybe 60 years or so, after the first discovery of crude in 1956 or thereabout in the Niger Delta region. But the truth also is that the kind of leaders that Africa has produced have, in Nigeria in particular, successfully stolen 400 billion out of the 600 billion that you've made from that. But where can you find them? You find their houses in France, you know, they bought houses in the UK, in the US, and now the United uh, Arab Emirates is where everybody is headed. In fact, one of uh, the candidates for Nigeria's presidential election next year, uh, who is incited in a lot of corrupt activities, is right now vacationing in the, the UAE, Dubai, as we speak. Just as I'm running around here, I'm also a candidate uh, trying to mobilize Nigerians in the diaspora to see how we can all return back home and make Nigeria a solid place so that your next vacation will not be done in Jamaica, you know, or some cozy island somewhere, but if you want to go to Nigeria, you want to go to Ghana, because this is the best places you can go to, you know, where you can find sunshine all day long. You know, I think here it's you know the sun rises too early in Australia. I came in five, six a.m. and it's already bright everywhere. In Nigeria, you know, you have to wait until the cock crows before you wake up, and that's lovely. You know, it's natural environment. You know. I'm not doing tourism promotion to you guys so that when I'm president, you come visit Nigeria. So amazingly, that's what the kind of leaders we've had on the continent of Africa. And we are not proud of it, you know, uh, as much as you should not be proud of them. We are also not proud of this kind of leadership. We know what they're about, we know how they came about, and that's what I've tried to explain to you uh, before now. So, but what is the way forward for Africa is what I'm telling you that it has to be complete overhaul of our political processes and programs and projects. There has to be complete overhaul of the continent itself, uh, diplomatically, politically, culturally, and traditionally. There has to be a total overhaul of leadership so that we have the A team out there on the continent of Africa that can relate to the rest of the world with utmost respect. You know, I say to myself all the time that there's no way Anyone, even if you're a Boy Scout in a European country, or even another African country can respect Nigerian leaders. Because I sit down with them all the time, I do interviews with them as a, journal, as a journalist, I talk to them and they don't have anything upstairs. So even if you want to respect us, you have nothing to respect because you have people who you could refer to as dummies running countries that have like 200 million people. You know, and I could name names, but you probably would know some of them, so but you can do your Google search. And until Africa gets to that point where they have leaders that are competent, that have capacity, integrity, and you know, and, and have character, you're not going to respect Africa. I'm sorry, it's just something we can do about that. And that's why the younger generation of Africans, I imagine, who are speaking powerfully to the desired need uh, to for Africa to have a new set of leaders. And we are doing so unapologetically, you know, uh, in, in my own case. And as uh, the person who introduced me, mentioned to you, I've been through a lot uh, in the hands of uh, Nigerian leaders. I've been expelled from the university in the 90s, uh, fought the military, fought corruption over these years. I've been in prison, I mean, in police detention several times. And all kinds of things have been done to me since I started running for the presidency about eight months ago, I've been around Nigeria a lot, 
and the country is mostly, mostly on government territory. So when you hear about Nigeria, you just hear about the state capitals, and of course, you hear about their lavish lifestyles, but over 80% of Nigerians live, you know, in poverty, you know, and, and when we say poverty, we're talking about abject poverty, to the extent that the minimum wage of a Nigerian worker is less, annually, it's less than the welfare checks you hand over to people who are jobless, here are people who are on welfare uh, in this part of the world. It's, it's the truth. And the reason is simple. Again, it boils down to leadership. You know? And uh, so it's, it's, it's just what I, I'm trying to say to you in a nutshell. Uh, for some reason, I didn't prepare for this in an elaborate way. Yes. But what you're saying in the background here is what we started about uh, eight months ago. My uh, seven and a group of uh, Nigerians within and outside Nigeria started a political movement known as the Take It Back Movement. And uh, the Take It Back Movement had this, some of these issues raised in here uh, behind me as how we intend to take Nigeria out of poverty, you know, the abject poverty I described, move Nigeria out of a responsible, uh, state of leadership that is in now, moving to progress, prosperity, and peace. So that the only thing you hear about Nigeria is not Boko Haram or terrorism, or it's not diseases, destruction, and bad leadership alone. That we can continue to see Nigeria, first and foremost, in a better light. And by extension, Africa, the continent of Africa. In fact, what we know, going by the research we've done, going by the interaction we've done on the continent of Africa, is that Africans are waiting on Nigeria to find its feet. And as soon as they do that, the continent of Africa will be a different continent, uh, starting from that point. You know, I, I came into Australia and it took me four hours on that. For the moment, I saw the map of Australia at the beginning on the east side, you know, to come to Brisbane, four hours. And if you look under the plane, you know, you can see infrastructure, you can see a country somehow that is well planned, you know, not, uh, and I, I haven't seen a country big enough to be able to speak categorically. Uh, I've been told that Queensland, which is a state here in, in, in uh, Australia, is big, it's almost as big as Nigeria. It's bigger than Nigeria, right? And so it's massive, but it's, you know, infrastructure is working everywhere. We have great schools. I went to my friend's school today, Mike Top, uh, who is one of our stars. And uh, it's, it's amazing how his high school looks. And my university that I graduated from some 30 years ago looked like a piggy. Uh, you can't even send your pig to go to those universities. And I'm not speaking bad about Nigeria, it's just the facts you know, of life in Nigeria. And uh, so how do you get there is what leadership would mean and it's what we, we want to do. So about two months ago, we started a political party registered in Nigeria. And I'm presenting myself as uh, a candidate for the presidency of Nigeria to replace the old guys. I have two major opponents. One of them is 72 years old. The other one, officially, you know, is about 76. But you know, if you count his teeth, you know he's like eighty something years old. Uh, and so we have, you know, the joke in Nigeria is that we are being led by our ancestors. That's the reason we don't have history. We don't. Yes. Lifeless. Yes. Lifeless. Yeah. I don't even want to go there yet. Uh, but this is the kind of obsolete country uh, or leadership we have. And it's not as if we're against their age, as we usually say as younger candidates. We're just against the age of the ideas. That it cannot take a country that is as vibrant and as dynamic as Nigeria to a level of progress and prosperity that is desirable at this time uh, for us. So we're presenting ourselves, and uh, these two guys are older than Nigeria. Nigeria got independence in 1960. <laughs> Nigeria is 58 years old. The youngest of them is 72. Uh, the older is about 82 or uh, thereabout. Nobody can really tell his age. Maybe his doctors in the UK can tell you the truth, but they never come out and tell us the truth. This is part of the problem, too. Is that we don't even have hospitals that can treat our presidents.
face in Nigeria. So anytime he has a headache, you know, he has flu or cold, he's put on an airplane, just out of the country, he might have gone for 100 years. Uh, I mean, who cares? It's Nigeria. He comes back whenever he wants. And stupid Nigerian politicians will put a signboard at the airport welcoming him back in like huge uh, billboards. Uh, so, without much ado, uh, just too much distraction or digression from where I am, I'm, I'm just speaking right from the bottom of my heart to you here. And for those of you who may not be Nigerians, speaking right from the bottom of my heart about African leadership. For me, it's nothing to write home about right now. Uh, but if we do it right, if we get it right, if we allow a generational transfer of power to more responsive, responsible, younger Nigerians who have exposure, who have integrity, like I said, character and capacity, uh, we will find an Africa that can engage with the rest of the world with you know, respect uh, and with dignity. And Africa as a continent that finally will regain its foothold in amongst community of nations around the world. Uh, when I say Africa, I'm not referring to Africa as a country, but Africa as a continent, just like Australia is a continent. So, so, but we need that. We need we need that leadership change so bad that uh, I can't even tell you uh, when it should have happened. I think it should have happened even 58 years ago, uh, so that. We can not continue like this, that, that much I know. And for those who may not care, if things continue like this, at some point, Africans will revolt. And something had to give, or has to give at some point. And it's a matter of time before that will happen. I don't know where it will happen first, but pray that it doesn't happen in Nigeria, because then you are waiting for a calamity or a catastrophe that is going to involve 200 million people. The world must have to wait first if anything wrong, if anything goes wrong in Nigeria. So on that note, uh, I want to thank you all for coming once again. I've been told that this is supposed to be interactive, uh, but I've mostly been speaking except for and going all over the place. So I hope uh, you picked up something in my talk here today that would make it possible for you to ask questions, make suggestions, and engage. Truthfully, thank you so much. Thank you. There's a question at the back. Um, sorry, you're going to need a microphone. A computer, maybe. Yes. Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. My name is Obina. I'm currently a UK student. I was on campus and I got off here. Sorry, I'm late. Yeah, um, That's fine. I had placement, so I had to. Uh, I just, I may have missed some of your point, um, but I just want to, my real concern about all of these manifestos as much as the many manifestos others would have least, um, I'm far more interested in the how, the question of how, you know, it's, it's not about the least, the least, it's the how. Um, perhaps let me just pick one or two yeah. from the health and education, how do you want to get rid of that? Thank you. The other questions I can take more than one question at a time. Yeah, do you want to? All right, okay. So, thank you. It's a very important question, and we get asked this question all the time. You know, I will start with a how by telling you how have we gotten it wrong, you know, and just why description about African leadership is we have been putting in these places very sensitive position people who have no idea how to do, get anything done. So how do we get it done, starting with health, for example, you know, is to look at what's our population in Nigeria, what are our head needs, what are the most basic head needs we have in Nigeria. You know, I will tell you that when it comes to health in Nigeria, we are at ground zero, almost ground zero, uh, to the extent that most Nigerians have never seen a doctor before in their lives, and, you know, and most, of them, I've seen a pastor, they've seen an imam, they've seen a babalao herbalist, but they've never seen a real doctor. And the first thing to do is to actually pump people out there to start giving them a chance to see a real medical doctor. And what we want to do, starting with 
our program is to have over 160,000 health professionals found out there and to then start to re-engage Nigerians who were trained as doctors who left the country either out of frustration or annoyance or you know uh, some kind of default that there's nothing else I can do. The Nigerian health minister came out recently, I think about three weeks ago, and granted an interview, the most bizarre interview any health minister could grant. He said, it doesn't, because doctors were upset and not going on strike, he said, I don't see any reason why every doctor wants to do a doctor. He said, you don't need to be a specialist. You can be a doctor and be my tailor. He said his tailor is a doctor. You know, so again, this is the kind of people you put in the health sector, a minister who says that you don't have to be a specialist. In a country that is in need of millions of doctors and only can boast all register of 42,000 doctors in Nigeria. So not only do we need to readmit and you know, uh, attract back those who have left, but we have to train new doctors we have to encourage health professionals to be all over the place. The reason why, when we're choosing our vice presidential candidate, we chose a public health professional for our party, the African Action Congress. And it is because when we did our research, when we started asking Nigerians what is most important to them, it was shocking to us that most Nigerians wanted health to be their first priority. So the next thing is to invest a good chunk of our budget in the health sector, because as it is well known and uh, uh, well spoken of that health is wealth. Without people being healthy, we cannot get Africa to have the wealth that we have all been you know, dreaming about. So what is this going to happen is look at what is our budget on an annual basis and how much are we dedicating and devoting to, to health, the health sector. And what is the real health sector that we need to start with? And I think the investment has to go into the primary health sector first, you know, because you look at people who are most vulnerable, they are women and children. You know, a lot of women who get pregnant don't actually get to deliver their babies. The ones who get to deliver mostly die before the babies are delivered during delivery. And most kids don't have access to what you take for granted here, immunization. You know, they're not immunized against all kinds of killer diseases. So most kids end up dying in a high infant mortality rate in Nigeria. I don't need to repeat that anywhere, you know. We are part of whatever terrible statistics out there in terms of health. So it's to look at how do we take care of all these people by way of investments, you know, by way of making sure that at every level that we can provide primary health care first, uh, that we do that. And then, of course, we go to the secondary ones where General hospitals are across the country. They exist, by the way. They do exist right now, but they are in dilapidated conditions, you know, that we start reviving them. And interestingly, we are hearing from a lot of Nigerians who are medical professionals that brought that if we can provide the enabling environment for them to come back home, they will even come back home and work for free. Some of them have contacted us that they want to do telemedicine. What is telemedicine is that, look, we can remain here in Australia, but provide a hotline for somebody who need, who is in need of medical health, uh, um, help to call a number and we can provide you know, telephone-based kind of medical support immediately to say, okay, this is the kind of, if you tell me your symptoms, this is the kind of uh, medicine you can take to relieve you of, of that. And then they can have a team that is coming in to visit Nigeria from time to time, as they do in Ghana. So there are a lot of ways that this, uh, this will happen, and I'm just giving you some of uh, the hows uh, that we tend to do this. When you talk about education, you have to look at how many kids are out there are out of school. 13 million kids in Nigeria are out of school. I mean, they have never been to primary school before. You know what primary school is, right? They've never been in school. They've never been within the walls of uh, primary school before. And what do we want to do? How? We want to invest 100,000 Naira each on each of those kids to bring them back to school so that just like you do here we can criminalize sending your children to hawk on the streets instead of going to school because you know if you don't go to school over here the, you know the school will come to you, call the father call the mom what's wrong in the u.s where i lived for 19 years if you don't send your child to school the police is going to come knock your door in the evening and ask what why you're keeping your child away from school 
that should be the way it is in Nigeria if we make the right investments, you know. And today, even what on Liberia, what on Liberia, the president of Liberia just we just mm -hmm. made tuition free in Liberia for the students. We would do the same in Nigeria because we have realized, and this is something we were doing even when we were student activists, that it was better to invest in health and education in particular than to invest in other things that we were told will make Africa great and prosperous. It never happened. What did the World Bank and IMF come back to do about two weeks ago? They came to apologize to us 30 years later that we have been heading in the wrong direction. Their policy advice, which was basically the structural adjustment program, was not going to help Africa to attain prosperity. It was health and education that would have done it for us. Because that is what did it for you guys in Australia, and it's doing it for you in Australia, it's what is doing it for them in India today. And every country that is doing well globally, they are doing it based on education, and education is what is going to bring about great health. Uh, but in Nigeria, we were just told to go and do whatever we can do, as long as Nigeria was properly prepared for Western countries that wanted to bring in their products into Nigeria. As long as Nigeria was prepared for the kind of privatization that would have priced great living for the people of Africa. That was what the economic policies that were thrown at Africa was about through the structural adjustment programs that we fought against that led some of us to, uh, to be expelled from the university and even spend some time in prison. So uh, there's a lot more ways that will break down to you. But unfortunately, uh, our party has been suffering in the hands of our opponent parties. Every time we bring down ideas, we steal them and appropriate them to themselves. Uh, so when we give us a breakdown of ideas, the next thing, the ruling party will steal the idea from us and they will not even give us credit for it. So we have been careful not to expose too much. Uh, sorry, yes. That's uh, plagiarism. What? That's plagiarism. Well, I don't even know what to call it. But, <laughs> but we, know that, we know that they will steal anything, you know. So I think it's content stealing. Uh, still our content and apply, including today before I came here. Uh, if anybody was following us, we were talking about that green expressway that doesn't have express included in it. So we talked about because we went to Badagre, it took us about six hours to go to Badagre and come back, which typically should have been 30 minutes. And we said, you know, that Badagre people should succeed from Nigeria. That's how we described. Today, yesterday, they met at the federal executive meeting and allocated money to. Uh, that road, but it probably is a gimmick, it won't be done, uh, we know that. But this is how they've been engaging with us and engaging with our ideas that we've been putting out there. <coughs> People can, of course, download this and read more. Everything I'm telling you is broken down, uh, even <coughs> in the document that we have uploaded here, so it's not difficult uh, to find, but I'm just kind of bridging life into it by way of engagement and interacting with the content you have behind me as to how best we can pull Nigeria out of poverty by investing a lot in education and health as opposed to investing in politicians and their lavish lifestyles. Thank you very much. My name is Ruben. Um, and let me first start by answering one question or should I say suspicion you have about Australia. If you're trying to dig into what role they are playing <laughs> in Africa. Yeah. Well, for now, so far, I can actually, um, let me see, I'm in testimony because I'm actually here on scholarship, yeah. fully funded by the Australian government. Wow, that's good. And at least I can attest to the fact that there are so many people. In short, um, I'll be leaving, I'll, I'll, I'm finishing tomorrow, you know, and then I'll wow. be going back in December. Congratulations. So we had this pre-departure briefing. And I remember very well when we were having the pre-departure briefing, those who oversee the scholarship program in Nigeria, yeah. she, um, the person came and what she told me was, this time around, the next um, batch of um, awardees will be starting in January next year. And in the whole of Africa, Nigeria actually got the highest score. It's over 30 people. When I came, we were over 5,000 who had applied. Only eight of us were taken. So for me, it's a plus. And having said that, one important issue 
And I truly want to appreciate you for one thing you've done. And I also take, you know, I follow that path. And, you know, it's a problem for most Nigerians, you know, especially for those of us who um, have the exposure or opportunity to, you know, go outside the shores of Nigeria. In terms of being honest or being sincere about the situation of things in Nigeria, a lot of Nigerians don't want to be honest about it. People don't want you to talk about Nigerians being corrupt or things are bad. You know, they don't. But then I'm someone that believes that if you have a problem, until you admit and you acknowledge that that problem is there, you can't solve it. Yeah. One key problem we have is security. I spent, I was born and brought up, spent almost all my life living in the northern part of Nigeria. You know, I grew there, school there. I worked for over seven years before I came here. You know, I have been fortunate to have escaped the suicide bombing, Boko Haram attack in Bauchi State in 2012. Wow. So I know the situation there. You know, there are times when I'm driving, ordinarily from Abuja to Bauchi, if you're driving, you take about four hours drive. But then sometimes it takes me about eight hours, you know, because the road is not safe. You know, you checkpoints, checkpoints, and all that. And this for me is a serious problem. And there are agitations from certain parts of yeah. this thing. Let's separate, let's separate. But then I believe you're running for president and you want to burn, you're not looking at separating or pulling Nigeria apart. So what's, what's your approach towards security? You know, that's one thing. And also in the, the other one is what's your concern about food? Food production is really important. Food security. Yes, well. yes. Thank you so much. Uh, before you praise Australia too much, I was actually setting a trap for you guys, and I <laughs> fell into it. This currency in my pocket is made in Australia, right? Mm -hmm. Have you guys heard about Securency? A company in Australia that makes currency. They're actually involved in a corruption scandal in Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so I caught you guys red handed. Now you know. So they, they make this currency supposed to be transparent. By the time they got involved with Nigeria, they had a deal with the Central Bank of Nigeria and it involved a lot of corruption. I don't know if the people involved were eventually punished in uh, Australia, but the ones in Nigeria only got political and social promotion. You know, the, bigger, the more money you steal, the better. So, so Australia has been, you know, some Australians so, uh, were involved, but uh, that is not to overshadow the great things that they've done uh, with you guys. You see, <coughs> Nigeria used to be such that we not only sent our children to school abroad, we used to pay salaries of countries that had you know, financial problems. We were the Father Christmas to Cuba, to Ghana, you know, to South Africa at a point. It's, it was a reason why when I went to South Africa, and South Africans were mistreating Nigerians, I got upset because I knew when we were growing up and we were fighting apartheid and on the streets of Lagos and elsewhere in Nigeria on behalf of South Africans. And when apartheid eventually collapsed, Nigeria had gone so badly, uh, terribly down the, 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 the toilet of leadership that South Africa became a star on the continent of Africa as opposed to Nigeria. So, but answering the question of security, uh, yes, we have Boko Haram uh, in Nigeria, we have Hestman, but the leadership in Nigeria is so horrible that every security issue in Nigeria escalates to something terrible. You know, when kidnapping got to Nigeria, it attained a different dimension. I mean, at a point, a friend of mine went to Nigeria to bury his parents, was in Southeast. They had to bring the parents for. The, the, the father who, who died to Lagos for them to because if they travel to the east during that time uh, when kidnapping was bad there's no way you make it out that was how bad it was so they had to do the barrier part of the barrier in Lagos and they went back to go to the US and they took the body back to, to the east they got to a point they were kidnapping people for recharge cards you know, I'm sure some people don't know what recharge cards are here what about me? It's, it was that bad Every security challenge in Nigeria has escalated to the worst. It was, it, you know, security challenges in Nigeria didn't start with Boko Haram. It started in recent times with Niger Delta militants. But each time there's a security problem in Nigeria, there's always complicity from the highest levels of the Nigerian military. Either they're selling weapons directly to militants 
or they are overlooking how to defeat the militants because of what they were direct, what they are directly benefiting from uh, the security imbroglio in the country. And we've seen that happen when Buhari came to power in 2015. They went around arresting military generals, air force generals, naval generals, and they found monies hidden everywhere in their houses. Some of them they put in seaway tanks. Some of them had under their cooking pots. There was money by these generals all over the place. There was an army general who was chief of defense staff. His name is Bade. His village was overrun by Boko Haram, and the soldiers let, ran away from the village. But because his dogs were trapped in his house, he sent a helicopter, a military helicopter, to go and retrieve his dogs and left his other villagers at the mercy of Boko Haram until Buhari came and then they were able to drive Boko Haram away from the village again. So, one of the things I propose is that, you know, and I mean this seriously, there has to be an overhaul of the Nigerian military, especially at the leadership. The leadership is rotten. They, have not, they are not interested in defeating Boko Haram because it brings in a lot of money for them. Even the idea of negotiating with Boko Haram to release girls is big business in Nigeria for these military leaders or the secret police. So until you do something about them, you are not going to defeat Boko Haram. You are asking yourself as in Nigeria all the time, where is it that Boko Haram gets his weapon from and the Nigerian states cannot get weapons from to defeat a ragtag army like Boko Haram? Is a problem of leadership in the military and corruption within the ranks and file of the Nigerian military. I have been a reporter for several years and found out when Buhari came out, his chief of army staff, which is still retained till now, but houses in Dubai. And everybody's asking, where did he get money to buy houses in Dubai? So these are the kind of problems you have in the security sector. And I think the second question you asked was uh, food security. See, Nigeria is capable of feeding itself and feeding even half of, our, half of Africa. But as you know, the most fertile areas of Nigeria or farming or agriculture has been abandoned because of cheap oil wealth. Uh, oil is what everybody is going to Abuja to collect money from at the end of the month. So nobody is growing crops anymore. Those days they used to teach us about cash crops. We still have them, but nobody is farming. Because the easiest way to make money is to go to Abuja you know, and share the oil money. And then the bankers will do round tripping. You know, and everybody is happy at the end of the day. The people are poorer. You know, but what is terrible about Nigerians, I have to say, with due respect to our people, is you cannot understand how people suffer so much. And they understand the source of their suffering, but they are the first to clap for their oppressors. And it is happening in this election now. The two candidates that are competing against us are the worst criminals you can find. And there's records, so we have records to show that this, they will lead this country down the path of perdition. But people are clapping for them. Young people are on Twitter as we speak here now, saying that they're articulating, you know, and we need to deactivate that kind of mindset in Nigeria for Nigeria to move. There are others who are supporting Buhari who we know clearly doesn't even know what he's doing, you know. The man has dementia, he's sick. Most of our leaders are sick. Very sick and tired people. But we keep promoting them. Uh, so sometimes you wonder, what's wrong with us? And that is what we're about to, to change uh, going forward. So I think uh, we've run out of time. Yeah, my first time. Yes. Yes. We want to thank you so much, Mr. Shogore. Um, can we give a round of applause? Yeah. I want to finish our column, Dr. Akolabi, to give a bit of time. I believe some of us will still have questions, and um, if you have some time, you might want to stay back to have a chat with uh, Mr. Shogore after now. Uh, Mr. Amir, yeah. Professor, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do we hand this over to you? Yeah, I think my voice should be loud enough. Okay, good, um, good, good. Go I, ahead. I don't need a microphone. Go ahead. Um, first and foremost, I need to apologize for coming a bit late. No um, problem. I had to drive seven hours. Wow. We're going down here, so. Um, yeah. uh, fortunately, I couldn't meet um, uh, Mr. Moyeli's um, presentation, uh, but at the same time, I'm glad that we have young minds here. Um, I think I 
and Universal Police Academy. Uh, currently, I work with the University of New England. Um, I'm a lecturer in criminology, so um, I just thought this is about Nigeria. And this is about our future. Some of us have been able to escape out of Nigeria. And here in Australia, United States of America, United Kingdom, everywhere, but we have the majority of Nigerians back home. They don't have any options, nowhere to mm -hmm. run to. That's right. And each time I think about my family, I think about my siblings, cousins, uncle, aunts, and everybody, um, the project Nigeria becomes a body. And it's not just a body that um, should be carried by individuals. It should be a collective effort. We should, you know, as in all of us, should come together and rescue Nigeria. And if we must rescue Nigeria, uh, it goes beyond rhetoric. It goes beyond um, business as usual. Uh, Nigeria is at a critical point where if we don't do anything, um, I'm sorry to say, I don't want to become a prophet of doom, but Nigeria is standing on the precipice and at any time, the nation can collapse. Mm. And Nigeria must not collapse. It's going to take young mindset, people like us, to come together. Um, to fight for the soul of Nigeria. And I want to thank Mr. Moyeli and the other young people coming up at this critical time. Um, even if um, at the end of the election, wherever the pendulum swings, um, I think we've sent a message to the old men and women back home that the young people, they're actually ready to fight for the soul of Nigeria. And I want to challenge each and every one of us don't think because you live in Australia that you've escaped. I want us each time we think, let's think about Nigeria. Let's find ways to participate in government. Um, as some of you know, I do a lot of live video and all this stuff, but that's not the key factor here. But the major thing is that if I can't go and live in Nigeria, it is going to take me to change one mindset. I'm committed to that. No. So the question is, what are you committed to? Uh, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Muslim, where, whichever religion you belong to, even if you're a free thinker, don't forget Nigeria. Let's not forget that. Let's fight for Nigeria. And I have hope, I'm very sure, that someday Nigeria will become a great nation. So once again, thank you for all, you know, thank you all for coming here, and thank you, Mr. Moni, all the way from the Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very quick.